So this is the lecture for module five. We are reading several uh, chapters from the work of Bruno Latour. I'm also assigning a lecture of Latour's, uh, the first Gifford lecture that he gave back in 2013. So I'm gonna try to keep this short and just give you a kind of high level summary of Latour's work and the, the chapters that we read, which include the first chapter of Facing Gaia, which is the book that came out of Latour's Gifford Lectures. We also read a chapter from uh, the anthology The Lure of Whitehead, uh, a chapter by Latour called What is the Style of Matters of Concern? And then we read a conversation between Latour and the post-colonial uh, theorist Depeche Chakrabarty uh, called Conflicts of Planetary Proportions. And it was in the Journal of Philosophy of History uh, in 2020. Latour just recently passed away uh, of cancer in October um, of 2022. I've uh, linked you to in our um, course page uh, with more resources. I've linked you to a obituary in the guardian there's several obituary obituaries you could find uh, that came out in various papers latour is uh, a f rather famous um, sociologist of science and has written a number of important books um, his his early career was focused on looking at science through the lens of anthropology or, or sociology, you might say, um, studying scientists in the way that anthropologists would, uh, European anthropologists a century earlier might study the sort of foreign exotic uh, cultures on the periphery of, um, of European civilization. He wants to create a kind of symmetry in an attempt to create a kind of symmetry between the modern scientific West and all these other cultures. He's turning the lenses and the tools of anthropology back on modern science itself to see how science is done in the laboratory and in the field. And what he discovers is that um, the theory, the epistemology of science, which you know goes all the way back to, to Descartes, um, you could say, doesn't at all match the practice, the, the concrete day-to-day -day practice of scientists, right? And so uh, one of Latour's early books, um, Science in Action, uh, shows the difference between what he calls ready-made science, which is this sort of finished product that uh, gets popularized, versus uh, science in the making, which is what goes on under the hood inside the black box, where you see how um, facts are negotiated, interpretations of experiments are, um, you know, controversial, and there's the issue of uh, funding and, um, you know, getting the laboratory equipment uh, calibrated properly and all of the careerism and competitiveness among scientists, all this stuff that just gets black boxed uh, when you're only dealing with ready-made science you know, on the, in the pages of Scientific American or National Geographic or something. So he lifts the hood on science and develops uh, what has come to be called actor network theory, um, tracing the way that science is produced within networks of uh, representation. Science and technology studies also comes out of this. And so Latour was um, really uh, an important figure in um, shifting how science is understood. Now, a lot of people blamed Latour for um, making scientific facts seem like just social constructs. This was certainly never Latour's intent, and I think a careful reading of his early work shows that this isn't at all what he was arguing, but in an attempt to clarify his understanding of how scientific facts are, yeah, constructed, uh, but not in human society, right? His, his whole point is that this bifurcation between human society and uh, material nature is itself a construct, right? 
um, with Whitehead and with Gabriel Tard, who he um, introduces in his chapter on what is uh, the style of matters of concern, Tard, like Whitehead, thinks that everything is social, right? This uh, idea that only human beings form societies is is just very short-sighted. Um, whether you're talking about uh, cells or organisms in an ecosystem of, of any scale, uh, or you're talking about subatomic particles, uh, as Tard puts it, or as Latour puts it, summarizing uh, Gabriel Tard, it is necessary to associate with others to remain in existence. It's just a fact uh, of, of nature, we might say. And so, you know, in an attempt to um, make it clear that Latour is very much on the side of science against the uh, weaponized ignorance of, you know, these various uh, think tanks like the Heritage Institute and so on, which have been trying to muddy the waters around climate science and the ecological uh, catastrophe. Uh, Latour thinks that the best defense of science is not this old theoretical epistemological view of capital S science that would, you know, pretend that science is about uh, this dualistic uh, purification of a mute material mechanistic world, making sure that we uh, scrub away any trace of, of any human subjective mental projections uh, so that we're left with just the bare facts, right, um, that speak for themselves. Latour wants to say that that's a very poor defense of science and that instead we ought to look at uh, the concrete practices of scientists, the worldwide networks of, of experts and of um, highly advanced, uh, well-calibrated instruments, right, from ice core sampling uh, systems to uh, satellites measuring methane release and all of this is you know, the basis for the construction of scientific facts. And if you compare these scientific networks and the concrete work, the tissue of proofs, as he puts it, that um, climatologists use to make their predictions and to calibrate their models, if you compare that to uh, the networks of lobbyists and corporate executives uh, and so on that uh, compose the so-called facts of these of the ignorance industry uh, and these these think tanks trying to muddy the waters and defend uh, the profits of oil companies and so on, it becomes very clear who has uh, access to to reality, right? To the actual processes of the earth. And so he wants to mount a defense of science, but um, he wants to mount this defense on the basis of a more realistic account of what science is and, and, and how it is done, right? So, you know, from Latour's point of view, we need to describe science as a practice rather than as a, a form of epistemology that never actually matched the practice. And we need to see how historically science, politics, and religion have always been mixed up together with one another. Um, it's not that we can't make distinctions between them, but we need to go about that business of making distinctions uh, far more carefully than we have in, in, um, in the modern period, as if religion and science were um, diametrically opposed to one another, um, and as if science had nothing to do with politics uh, and so on. He wants to bring science, politics, and religion down to earth. He wants to see human history as um, bound up in and, and part of what he calls a geo-historical adventure. And for Latour, Gaia uh, is, is, is this new um, sort of basin of attraction he wants to draw us into precisely because it is such a muddle, right? Um, Lovelock proposed the idea of Gaia as a kind of self-regulating um, complex system. And uh, many other scientists initially said, uh, this, is a, this is a mythic goddess that you're trying to foist upon us? Like, get out of here. Um, 
when in fact Latour and Lovelock both, uh, you know, mean to defend this this idea of Gaia on a scientific basis. It's it's this new kind of science that that Latour, this new account of actually the same kind of science that Latour is putting forward. But he wants to make clear that you know he doesn't imagine Gaia as a kind of um, Mother Earth figure who might nurture humanity if only we uh, repent um, and learn to love her and live within her limits again. Uh, Gaia, on Lovelock's reading and, and Latour's reading, is is not a unity, um, and there's not some kind of providential geoengineer at the helm of of the Gaian systems of feedback loops that is assuring that habitability uh, continues on this planet. If you look at the history of the planet as best we can piece it together, um, the history of Gaia is, is really one catastrophe after the next. It's a whole series of contingent events super volcano eruptions and asteroid impacts and, you know, the oxygenation crisis uh, a few billion years ago when, um, you know, uh, uh, oxygen uh, emitting bacteria uh, were kind of polluting the atmosphere because oxygen was still toxic for most life forms at that point. So the history of Gaia is is not some smooth um, ramping up of um, you know more and and more regulation and and order. It's uh, it's quite chaotic, and so um, Latour is under no illusions that uh, somehow you know coming to accept Gaia as as a reality. Um, and that we live, human beings live within Gaia, and that, you know, the Earth is not just a stage upon which the historical march uh, of civilizational progress can continue, but rather um, that the Earth really does create, um, provide a set of limitations that that humans must learn to live within. Um, Even if we do come to accept these limits, you know, an asteroid could hit tomorrow. And so Latour really doesn't want to um, give the impression that he thinks that, um, you know, Gaia is this providential creature of some kind. Um, He thinks, you know, if we want to survive the coming ecological catastrophe, I mean, coming, it's it's already here, right? And if we want to survive, we need to uh, get over the old concept of religion, whereby just faith and hope uh, might save us. And we also need to get over the old idea of science as some kind of externalized universal knowledge. And he's really trying to summon a people of Gaia, right? By trying to describe the, the rights that might maintain its, as well as our own existence. And you know, for Latour, rites and and rituals are not something that uh, we we should imagine we can grow out of. Um, they will always be part of what it means to compose a common world together. So we need to find a way to, um, you know, bring this traditional idea of ritual and 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 rites of of world composition. Uh, together with the more modern ideas of, of another kind of rights, right? Human rights, individual rights, and so on. Um, I don't think Latour is proposing that we let go of the I- important ideas of modernity, um, you know, individual rights, human rights, chief among them. But he wants to contextualize that uh, we aren't separate substances as individuals and that um, our right to life depends very much on our capacity to um, together find the rites or rituals that would uh, maintain Gaia and thereby maintain and sustain our own existence. So 
in uh, his Gifford lecture, you'll see he's trying to um, help the people of nature who imagined nature as some kind of unity um, defined by science, understood in an epistemological way. He wants to help these people understand themselves better. Um, and he proposes a new name for nature, uh, that out of which we are born. And he explores the way that the people of nature and the people of God actually share uh, when you just look at the attributes of this being, whether a unified nature or a unified God, it's not all that different, right? And so again, we're seeing um, the underlying uh, metaphysical resonance between the modern scientific idea of nature and the medieval idea of God. And um, we shouldn't think of these as opposed ideas so much as different inflections of the same idea. Um, Latour goes on at length discussing the various ways that naturalism or materialism or scientism um, makes it impossible for us to reconcile the outside with the inside, right? The outside meaning the material world with the inside meaning the, the spiritual world or the social world or the cultural world, mind and matter, right? Um, in his chapter uh, from the lure of Whitehead, he goes into more depth about the bifurcation of nature as Whitehead understood it uh, and the importance of overcoming this by adopting uh, William James's sense of radical empiricism where we don't look for or, or expect science to reveal a world that might be set apart from our common sense experience and by which our common sense experience might be explained or worse explained away. Uh, rather, we try to bring science back down to earth, right? And, and recognize that nature never really was bifurcated and that the idea of matter, however, has uh, led us to believe that somehow there's a, um, a world out there that is the cause of, of our experience uh, that would be a non-experiential world of just mute matter in motion. Um, Latour thinks that this is a function of the worst kind of abstraction, and in fact, uh, the worst kind of idealism. Strangely enough, materialism turns out to be a form of idealism in the sense that uh, this method of bifurcating nature between so-called primary and secondary characteristics, which is useful in some instances for, you know, if we want to dramatically simplify, um, you can bifurcate nature as Galileo did. And, you know, it, it leads to these equations of motion, which indeed are quite useful. But the problem is that the method became a metaphysics, right? It was ontologized. And this has led to all sorts of confusions because after all, you know, as, as Whitehead um, points out, even the primary characteristics, right, of size and shape and motion, all the quantitative things, um, they're also only ever presented to us via sense perceptions, right? And then, yes, we represent them mathematically, but then that's a that's a mental, uh, conceptual thing, right? So size, shape, and motion, far from being um, just qualities of mere matter in motion, are in fact uh, in the same boat as the secondary characteristics, right? Of, of sounds and scents and, uh, and colors and so on. So, you know, rather than this incoherent bifurcation, Latour wants to... Um, reimagine the practice of science as an effort to stitch together various forms of experience, right, into networks of explanation that don't require explaining away what is uh, most intimately known, uh, namely our own, you know, flow of conscious experience. Latour invites us to, uh, as he puts it, go with the flow. So, you know, Latour points out that while, again, the theory of reductionism 
in materialistic science claimed to uh, show the simple mechanisms that underlie the apparent complexity of nature. In fact, the practice of science has always multiplied the number of agencies known to be operating um, in the, the Earth's various processes and, and beyond it, um, right? So again, when you contrast the theory of science, the epistemology of science with the practice of science, uh, you see just how uh, confused modern people have been about, about what they are doing. In his Matters of Concern chapter, uh, Latour says that he wants to follow the poets in their quest for reality, you know, rather than the reductionistic scientists who would engage in heroic feats of explaining away our uh, experience of the world. He wants to uh, follow the poets, right, in their quest for reality. He thinks science needs to be understood as um, not a transparent window upon the world, but rather as something adding itself to the world, right? Science is a constructive activity. So he says science is adding itself to the world. The sciences can be added to the flow of experience as yet another way to fold oneself inside it, right? So again, he's trying to bring science down to earth rather than it being this transcendent view from nowhere. He wants to situate it uh, in the middle of things themselves, right? Adding itself to the tissue of our experience rather than pretending to step outside that flow so as to view it from an ahistorical, uh, uh, non-locatable point of view beyond it. Another way of, of describing the confusion of a method uh, a useful method, confusing that with a metaphysics, is the way Latour talks about the confusion between uh, visualization strategies and ontology. So then in his conversation with uh, Dipesh Chakrabarty, uh, Latour lays out a view of the 20th century and these various moments of um, apparent moral clarity, 1918 after the First World War, 1945 after the Second, and 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell and the Cold War ended. And he points ha out how at each moment there was already in 1918, already in 1945, and certainly in 1989, a sense in which um, an ecological mutation was underway that would force uh, modern civilization to course correct. But instead, especially after 1945, with the U.S. victorious uh, over Nazis, right, the, the moral clarity of that situation, of that battle, uh, obscured the fact that the great acceleration, uh, the Americanization of the, of the world and the, the expansion of the um, neo-colonial global capitalist marketplace, marketplace after that point, uh, in fact, um, accelerated ecological catastrophe, right? And so Latour's point then um, many decades later in 1989, when it seems that the liberal capitalist West defeated the uh, Soviet Communist East. Uh, Latour's point is that, look, this ecological mutation is just as incompatible with, with liberalism uh, as, it, as it is with communism. And liberalism and communism, in Latour's view, both share this sort of industrialist mentality that separates the human being from the rest of nature and imagines nature there as just raw material to support our emancipatory projects and you know liberals and communists might have had a different approach to this emancipation but the idea of a kind of human freedom defined in opposition to nature what what was called nature or what was called matter 
uh, you know, Latour sees as running through both of these uh, otherwise opposed political worldviews or, or ideologies. Then uh, Chakrabarty responds by bringing in a sort of non-Western post-colonial look at this history and talking about there was a, a the way in which, you know, one could understand um, the Chinese Communist Party in earlier decades being driven by the desire to emancipate the masses, right? Uh, to lift more people into the middle class and in India as well. And he thinks, you know, he's willing to admit that what may have been authentic decades ago is now more of a performance. And um, the, the, the drive, though, at this point is for all of those peoples who were uh, considered to be on the periphery of um, the the modernization front. Uh, they want their middle class uh, lifestyles too now, right? And the problem is we don't have enough planets to support, um, you know, many billions of uh, middle class consumers. And so we're in a rather um, delicate moral situation where... Right, Europe and North America are trying to tell the developing world that they can't develop because that would doom us all. Right, even though um, you know, for many decades during the twentieth twentieth century and and the whole colonial era, um, these these peoples in the global south were colonized and exploited for the sake of producing this great wealth uh, in the global north. And so um, this is why this conversation between Latour and Chakrabarty is called Conflicts of Planetary Proportions. So much of Latour's work is an attempt at um, setting the stage for a kind of diplomacy that's already necessary and will become increasingly so because he really wants to avoid war. And you could say that we are already at war and that he's trying to wake scientists up to the fact that they need to um, acknowledge as, you know, the character uh, in a play, uh, Gaia's Global Circus, that Latour talks about um, in the first chapter of Facing Gaia, uh, who says to a climate skeptic, uh, tell your people that the scientists are on the warpath. Uh, Latour says, yeah, right on. This is a war. It's a war of the world's. And he's trying to set out the terms for a peace treaty uh, that would involve the various peoples that inhabit this planet learning better how to represent their values, how to represent where uh, they, they live and what they live for, right? Their ultimate concerns. But he's trying to bring us all back down to earth and challenge this modernist idea of science as in possession of some universal knowledge of uh, a unified nature, right? He thinks that this is actually quite a violent idea, has been historically, and if we insist upon it as modern Western people, it will continue to be into the future. We need to inhabit a pluriverse rather than a universe. That's uh, Latour's call here. So I'll leave it at that uh, and look forward to engaging you in the discussion forum.